Hi, Teardown Time again. What we've got here is a uh, domestic gas meter, but this is um, a fairly modern unit in that it uses ultrasonics for doing the measurement rather than a mechanical method that gas meters have used for probably over 100 years. Now, um, I first saw one of these, just missed out on it on eBay a few months ago, and I've been on the lookout for another one since because I thought it'd be quite interesting just to see how the measuring works and maybe see what they've done in the way of anti tamper and so on. The original one I saw was a conventional meter which just gave an indication. This one's actually got this ugly sort of clutched on add on uh, which takes a card. This is a prepayment meter, so for customers where um, the gas company doesn't think they've got enough credit, they give them this card, they go to a shop that then gets charged up with credit at some uh, generally fairly unfavourable uh, rate and they then plug it in the meter and it um, provides the uh, credit to uh, let the gas through. Um, the other difference between this and a conventional meter is that a credit meter will probably also have the ability to turn the gas off if it runs out of credit. The uh, I don't know whether the some of the um, the non-prepay ones uh, apparently have Zigbee so maybe there is also a way of remotely um, turning those off. But the uh, the basic case of the meter is the same uh, the, as the other version although there might be some other differences um, internally. Um, just a couple of buttons on here, it's saying please wait, for sure, and then there's various options that you can uh, show, yeah, show it was like a mount ode and various tariffs and so on. If you press and hold that you get a few other options. Yeah, so there's various things you can uh, display, various um, tariffs and so on. And they're saying so cards, it probably means there's some options here that you can read off the credit on the card and so on. And this other button on seems to do a great deal, but it just uh, activates a beeper. I imagine that beeper is probably to say it beeps if it's about to run out, so you know before all the, uh, the heating goes off. Now the first sort of, not so much anti-tamper, but at least tamper evidence is the, uh, the fixing screws. The screws have got these plastic caps in this one I've uh, just drilled out to get access to. So the idea is that these are caps that, you know, once they go in, can't be taken out again without damaging them. And this one actually has, probably a bit hard to see, there, there's like an embossed mark on there, so presumably the idea is that that's relatively difficult to uh, copy, so you can at least have evidence that the thing's been taken apart. And the actual main meter, you've just got the uh, current reading on there. Every soft it changes to turn all the segments off, we, uh, sorry, to turn all the segments on. Uh, which will be a display test because obviously if you've got a missing segment you could uh, one problem with the seven segment display if you've got a, se a segment missing then it could potentially read a wrong digit like I say six instead of an eight for example if one of the uh, segments is out that's why multimeters always turn all the segments when you turn them on just to give you a quick uh, display test all right if we take this front off you see it's a completely independent unit there's a uh, an infrared um, LED and probably photo transistor here for communication with the uh, infrared power on the meter. These infrared links are very common on utility meters these days. And there's a big uh, lithium, uh, D-sized lithium battery here. Again, these are quite commonly used for metering applications. They've got a very long lifetime, provide a fairly re reasonable, um, reasonable amount of uh, current. And that's just obviously plugged in for a nice reliable connection rather than using um, studs or anything. And um, if when it's off I sort of click the button it says please wait forever so obviously that please wait it's actually doing some infrared protocol with the uh, the main meter trying to talk to it. So it could be that um, a lot of the functionality is actually in the main meter and this is basically uh, not much more than user interface. Right, there's nothing particularly exciting in here if we pull this display off. Um, we've got a smart card slot down here. There's some protection components and a fairly big chunky trans orbs or something similar. Part of that's going to be for static protection, but some of it may also be to prevent someone inserting something in here and sort of spiking some voltages on here to try and um, make it do things it shouldn't. Microwave voltage regulator there. Um, that's a comparator. I'm not quite sure what that's doing. Um, well, it is next to the um, 32k type crystals that might be being used as a um, an oscillator for the 32 kilohertz real time clock. This surprisingly big chip, um, don't recognise the uh, maker's name is ET-MET010, so it's probably a chip designed for sort of metering type applications. Uh, the fuse there, look at its position. I'm guessing that's probably to um, Again, prevent, say, a short on here doing anything nasty to the battery because obviously that smart card will need its own uh, power supply. So, my guess is 
that's either protecting that or it could be just a fuse for the incoming battery supply because these batteries don't like being shorted they tend to sort of catch fire and do other undesirable things there's a 4 megabit flash ROM here and a little e-squared for configuration data and 4 meg seems quite a lot but I guess yeah, this could be a fairly generic metering solution that covers all sorts of um, different scenarios and they just use it, you know, they just configure it to do whatever they need to do in a particular application so um, it's probably a little bit of overkill in terms of amount of silica, silicon area but because of the metering there's all sorts of different um, permutations of you know smart meters and prepayment meters and so on it could be this just covers everything and they just you know buy this in and configure it how they want it and there's just a sounder there for the uh, the beep um, that's pretty much it there's not really anything of any other interest in here now something i just noticed with this on the bench is you can actually hear a very slight tick from the ultrasonic sensing in here Let's stick the microphone right up to it and see if you can hear it Interesting, it seems to only be going about a couple of times a second, so I suppose I wonder if one way of um, subverting this is you can arrange something that actually takes gas in bursts in between the measurement. Um, right, so if you look in here, if we take the cover off, we don't really see anything, it's all a sort of sealed enclosure. The only thing we've got access to is the battery, which is obviously the same, um, same type of battery, and this whole thing's been sealed in with some sort of, sort of slightly soft sealant. Over here. Yeah, it looks like there's a access port there which has been sealed over. I don't know if that's a, a reset or some sort of test data access or something. But we have to uh, either dig this sealant off or just start hacking metal to uh, see what's going on in this thing. Well, I've peeled all this um, sealant off and this sort of front bit is actually um, soldered down with a couple of tabs so let's see if the good old Metcal is man enough to uh, unsolder these see is some uh, big number of silica gel in there. Well, if you've got sealed enclosure you want to make sure that um, any residual moisture doesn't stay in there and sort of condense out. And sort of PCB in here, nothing obvious. Again this board seems to be soldered in place. We've got some sort of tab have up there and also some uh, pins there so I'm guessing because obviously this is a gas tight enclosure my guess is this will be um, some sort of sealed feed through into the actual gas area or it could actually be sort of an ultrasonic sensor unless it's maybe a metal can or something that's going through into the, um, the, gas, the gas zone before going any further, I'll have a quick probe around here in case we break anything. Um, I'm using a, a time to 100 probe here just in case because um, ultrasonics can sometimes use quite high voltages so I don't want to risk um, blowing the scope up. Um, about the only signal I can find is about 80 volts so it's uh, not insignificant. Now this is um, putting out a pulse about every 5 seconds what's interesting is the timing does actually appear to be sort of quite randomized so my guess is this is some randomization of the interval to avoid it being tricked by you know if you could have some sort of gas valve or something that only opened it you know every five seconds when it's not doing the measurement you could potentially um, you know get gas through without it being measured so my guess is they're putting some randomization into the sampling interval to um, stop you doing that so leaving it running for a minute or two you can see it's it seems to be picking one of a set number of uh, delay periods so this short period is maybe a wake up interval so if you wanted to try and sort of game this meter by only pulling gas at certain times you'd probably actually have to sense the ultrasonic pulse and then make sure you only sort of turned on within this window because it does seem to be a fairly fixed window obviously this is going to be about power management so you're not it doesn't run the battery down but obviously you know this area here it's not sensing but you know you can't rely on doing it at a regular interval because that interval 
keeps changing um, on a sort of apparently random uh, basis. Again, I don't know whether maybe this, this sampling frequency might change depending on whether it's seeing a higher flow rate or not. Um, this, I think there's a valve in here that's closed, so I can't actually get any gas, you know, any flow through it. But maybe if we can get that open and just see if this sampling interval actually um, gets faster when there's actually some flow. Right, I've just unsoldered these tabs and it does seem this board is fixed here, so I think these are going to need to be unsoldered. Um, I was going to see what happens when I pull the battery. Um, so I'll pull the battery on um, on this unit. It now just gives this sort of M indication. So it's obviously some something that needs to be initialised when it gets a new battery. So I'm not sure if this will carry on working after I uh, power it down. Let's see what happens. Just power it down for a while. There's a few pads over here. I suspect there might be some capacitors in here just to provide the peak energy for the uh, pulse. So that's actually got a minus plus indication but also there seems to be some star connections onto this one here. Just make sure that's uh, discharged. Let's see what happens when I turn it back on. Yeah it seems to be going back to its old mode except this has changed from an R to a B. I don't know what that 185 means. It could be the um, calorific value or something has been programmed in or just some sort of status code. So under here we've got various stuff. Um, it's got 10,000 off capacitor, so this is what's providing the um, the peak current for the actual ultrasonic sensing. Because obviously the uh, battery is going to have um, probably a sort of relatively high source impedance because it's designed as a long life low power thing, so that's going to be uh, providing the sort of power boost to the actual uh, ultrasonics. And we've got a couple of chips and an NEC processor, which uh, you don't see many of those these days. Um, date codes on this were about 2004-2005 and this which I'm guessing is probably a custom chip for that um, this specific application and actually a, quite a lot of just discrete transistors and um, other stuff at least squared there for configuration. This looks like um, probably some uh, link options I guess. Um, display is just on uh, in straight down to this um, NEC chip and yeah, nothing uh, particularly exciting and we've got the uh, this is the actual sort of feed through to the gas I don't know whether this is actually just the whole transducer assembly or just a sort of gas type feed through to sort of parts that are distributed inside the, um, the gas enclosure right, the seam on this appears to be soldered all the way around so the maker is not going to hack that I think I'll do is try and cut it and um, the solder's quite soft it might be possible to cut it and then sort of maybe peel some of it so I don't have to actually cut the whole thing off. Let's give it a go. I'll just cut a section of the joint out and it looks like it's sort of been sort of folded over multiple times so I think we should have to cut all the way around this to uh, get in here. So as, as I suspected this is just a, a gas type feed through and we've got various uh, bits of stuff in here including this uh, sort of fabric -y type stuff. I'm not sure if maybe that's some sort of acoustic wadding or something to... Right, I'll just chop this feed through out so we can connect it back up again. We've just got uh, presumably these two lead ultrasonic transducers and this which I'm guessing is to the um, Shot off valve, which is in this sort of feels like some sort of filter material. Right, as I suspected, this is a um, solenoid valve that shuts the uh, gas supply off. Obviously because it's battery powered it's sort of it's bi-stable so if we connect power one way it goes one way, 
that's the other way closes and that there's a sort of diaphragm here so as far as I can see the gas sort of goes in this tube out of this vent here then into this part here across the back then up here and there's an ultrasonic transducer either side so it's I think the ultrasonics are basically measuring the time of flight between uh, yeah, as the gas goes here so the higher the flow rate the faster the ultrasonic pulse will get to the other transducer one thing I'm a little bit surprised at, there doesn't seem to be any sort of pressure sensor in here because I would have thought that uh, to measure flow rate you'd also need to know pressure to turn the flow into a volume so um, a little bit puzzled by this lack of, unless maybe you know gas pressure is consistent enough that they can ignore it but um, or unless maybe they've got some clever way of compensating it based on uh, the signals from the transducer but so a little bit surprised not to see a pressure sensor in here Right, I've managed to chop all the metal away from this so we can actually get it down to the uh, core parts. So we've got this shut off valve and this has basically got like a rubber stopper on the end. It just opens and closes. I guess I, um, that capacitor has also probably got quite a lot to do with uh, firing this on this pulls about half an amp coil current so um, at least some of the function of that capacitor is going to be up be just to supply that current to operate the uh, valve and that valve just seats onto here so it just lets the gas either sort of flow out through it or um, blocks it off. I think this filter bag is simply just filtering the gas as it's coming through because this this was sort of basically wrapped around this, this, this aperture here so this is just for, probably for providing for filtering any dust or moisture or anything out of the gas supply and um, probably done like this rather than small discs you've got a you know, very big surface area so this filter isn't going to clog because it's just got you know, this huge amount of surface area for um, the filter sort of quite thick about uh, four mil thick and then this is the actual uh, measurement chamber so the gas what goes in here goes along here and then comes out I'm guessing these maybe these the bottom did seem to have these, I think these might just be sort of moisture traps so again to trap any particles or uh, moisture that's in the gas supply and we've got these, uh, the ultrasonic transducers which look like they're designed to sort of go down there, bounce and then go back um, I did a little bit of reading on these, what they do basically is they send a signal from one direction measure the time and then send another signal in the other direction and so the difference in those times is proportional to the uh, rate of flow of gas because obviously the, um, the ultrasonic signal is using the gas to sort of carry it through so the faster the gas is moving you know it's good that the signal is going to be faster in that direction than that direction uh, apparently some of these all meters as well as using the, uh, the the valve for you know accounting purposes they also do things like trying to detect, detect leaks so for example if it sees a you know, long-term high consumption or sort of sudden high consumption they can actually just shut the gas off as a safety measure in case it thinks there's a uh, leak in the system this is what the actual sensors look like there's uh, what feels like a ceramic disc there it's a big block of rubber here which is uh, obviously a shock shock resistant mounting it's be fairly uh, solid so that's uh, just a it'll be just a standard piece of ceramic um, ultrasonic transducer well, I just checked the voltage on this capacitor and it's actually only got about half a volt on it so um, I'm guessing this is just used for the solenoid and it's charged up on demand. One problem with using a big cap in applications like this is they do have sort of significant leakage current so if you just connected it straight across the battery it'd end up sort of you're on the risk of discharging the battery so for things like this where it know you know it's going to know when it wants to fire this um, solenoid it will just charge you know, switch switch current into that capacitor wait for it to charge up and then fire it into the um, the solenoid just so you've got that high current available available but without um, putting any continuous drain on the uh, battery right I just hooked up a, um, a little fan on there to create some flow so you can see this is showing 45 226 I'm not quite sure what the B is turn the fan on That's just the display test that it does periodically. So it's now gone up to 231, 233, so it's now counting the uh, forward flow. Let's see what happens if we, we reverse the flow direction. Well, as you'd expect, it's not actually counting anything. Um, 
for reverse flow it may well be setting some internal flag like an alarm flag or something to um, indicate that something weird's going on but uh, it's not showing anything on the screen right, I'll put a slightly more serious fan on here so let's see what happens if we uh, crank the flow rate up and see if it uh, does anything interesting Seems to cope whether it's still accurate or not, I've no idea. It uh, seems to work over a fairly wide range of flow rates, which is what you'd expect for a meter like this. Right, it took quite a lot of poking around this thing to get some um, useful looking signals out of it. I was expecting to see it sort of sending like a burst of um, ultrasonic signals and then sort of looking for a response but actually it's quite a bit simpler than that what you're seeing here, these are the, the yellow and green of the two, two transducers so you can see it's pinging the transducers alternately with this random um, delay time and if we now then sort of look at look at that in more detail this is actually not quite as complex as it looks all it's doing is it's basically it's charging this transducer up I'm not quite sure what this dip here is about I think something to do with the way the circuit works basically all it's doing is it's charging the um, transducer up to about 50 volts and then very suddenly discharging it to create a ping so we've got a sort of fairly short fall time there so it's obviously just shorting the transducer out to generate the ping and this top waveform is from some some receive circuitry and obviously it goes a bit nuts because it's you know it's suddenly seeing that this transient so it, it settled down it probably clamps the input to um, that's probably sort of like an input clamp just to um, Dead in the transducer and stop all the ringing so it can then um, look for the receive signal and this is actually the receive signal I, can't, I couldn't actually find you know I, I'm sure obviously there's, a, there's an amplifier somewhere in that chip and I couldn't immediately find any nice sort of you know, amplified and conditioned output from that that's about the best I could get which is from, from some of the um, discrete circuitry so if we look at the position of this so this is with, with no flow if I now turn the, the flow on you see that's now becoming earlier so that's the, the downstream receive so yeah, it's now within the airflow so the um, the signal's getting stronger also the amplitude's dropped down a little bit I think it might be just because there's a bit, bit of damping going on from the um, the airflow and maybe a bit of turbulence so we turn the airflow off again that then goes back to its uh, nominal position if I now trigger off the other uh, the other transducer which would be the um, the upstream one we should then see it go in the opposite direction so again there so we're now we're, because we're now upstream it's taking longer to get back so it's delaying more when there's um, flow on but um, yeah, there's very tiny little delays and obviously some quite uh, interesting stuff going on to get a reasonably accurate figure coming in um, the utility meters generally are designed to meet quite tight accuracy specifications so it's uh, clearly going to be do some, doing some quite accurate um, timing on this to um, get the measurements the other surprising th thing was where you know, I was messing around with the transducers and like disconnecting them somewhere and the display wasn't giving any sort of indication that you know hey I can't hear myself or anything um, again yeah they may well be locking some internal stuff but uh, I'm surprised that the front panel didn't show any sort of you know error indication it just, just sat there with its um, normal reading the other thing I thought was a little bit surprising is when you power it up it doesn't operate this um, solenoid because presumably you know it's just a bipolar solenoid so it doesn't actually when you can it first connect the battery it probably doesn't know which way this is pointing whether it's open or closed so I'm a little bit surprised it doesn't do just a yeah two operations on it the initial battery connection just to make sure that it knows which um, which position it's in but maybe that's part of the factory or some sort of factory initialization when you uh, replace the battery but um, just seems slightly surprising it didn't do that because it doesn't you know it doesn't know where the solenoid is uh, of course I mean, it's possible this thing could be faulty but uh, just seems a little bit odd and this um, solenoid valve there's a sort of this sort of spring arrangement here to give it a bit of uh, constant tension and it it's sort all of, it, the, um, this is clearly a, some sort of permanent magnet solenoid, there's sort of probably a magnet rather than a, a simple metal slug on the um, 
the moving part because when it's forward it actually sort of locks so it's, it's locked off and you need quite a lot of force so obviously actuating it to get it to um, release and open if you, you can actually feel it sort of sticking so it's obviously a permanent magnet that's sort of sticking to the uh, the front surface when it's in its closed position I'm surprised at how big this thing is yeah, it's not producing a huge amount of force but uh, no particular reason for it to be super small but uh, just a bit surprised at how big that is Oh, I'll just pull this apart. Um, seems to be a ridiculous amount of copper in this thing, and the um, the magnets are actually here, so it's creating a sort of magnetic circuit sort of through here. So it looks like this is narrowed down so that when it's in this open position, the the circuit's weaker, so it doesn't stick in this open position. But when it's closed, you get a sort of the circuit that effectively pull, pulls this to here and to uh, lock it down in the closed position. But I'm just amazed at how much wire there is on this thing. I would have thought they could have done it with less wire and actually had um yeah, they've already got a circuit to charge up a capacitor and um, fire it to operate this. I would have thought maybe if they'd have just used a, perhaps a higher voltage just to give a more of a um, yeah, just a, a higher peak current, they could have done done it with less copper, but I mean this thing's I mean, it's quite seriously heavy. It must be pretty expensive. Yes, I did strip this down. This is copper. It's not aluminium or steel or anything cheap. I mean, there's a, must be a good half pound of copper in there or something, something like that. I right, know I've actually seen it working. Take, take a look at this. Um, basically, this is, it looks like we've got um, a cap here which is ultrasonically welded on. You also notice there is a slight ridge here. I don't know if that's a mechanical or acoustic properties. Maybe to provide some sort of lensing or um, Fred echoes, so uh, I think we'll have to chop this to uh, see if there's any features inside it. Now this is just a fairly simple rectangular tube. It's got quite a quite a narrow um, aspect ratio. I'm guessing that's probably just so that to keep to avoid sort of getting like multi-path reflections from the side. So it's sort of primarily working in this this direction. Um, this curved bit does actually sort of extend inside, so that's presumably having some sort of acoustic effect on it. But other than that, it looks. Uh, Fairly straightforward. So doing as the inlet end, it does have this taper, um, I, and also yeah, the, the uh, gas sort of came through that filter into the main body of the cylinder into there. So my guess is that this is probably to reduce turbulence because you want a nice sort of clean, sort of smooth flow there rather than turbulence in there. So um, I'd imagine that's probably just to get a nice sort of smooth flow of gas inside without it sort of swirling around at all. Now just looking at the uh, power consumption of this, it looks like it's about 22 microamps when it's not doing anything and then obviously it increases when it's taking the measurements. Let's take a look at that. Right, let's try and figure out how much current draws um, due to the actual measurement. So I've got the scope showing the output of the microcurrent, although in some cases you can just use a resistor to measure it. depends on um, what sort of level of current we're talking about. Now we're down to 2 millivolts per division so it's very noisy so if I put this on normal acquisition mode we're just going to see basically not much more than noise. Um, so this is where averaging and high resolution acquisition comes into its own where it's, yeah, each sample is a, an average multiple reading so we actually now get a nice clean reading without all that high frequency crap. So we can see obviously we do have this randomization going on that we don't already know about but um, if we assume for the moment that it's taking a um, if we assume for the moment it's taking reading about once every two seconds that's going to give us a fairly close system obviously if we're looking at battery drain you know we really want to know about the worst case we don't really need super super accuracy on this most of the time so we're going to assume that it's doing it every two seconds and we can actually look, so obviously it's quite a complex peak, it's got quite a few um, different components to it. But again, because these ones are really spiky, we can probably not really pay too much attention to those. So we can look at the, the amplitude, let's just take this as a sort of an average amplitude of this. So that's, this is one millivolt per uh, milliamp. So um, this is about sort of two and a half milliamps or so. And the time it's taking that for is around 30 milliseconds. So to work out the average, we do two 2,000 milliseconds 
divided by 30, which gives us about 61 in 66% duty cycle. So if we take that current figure of 2.5 milliamps, that gives us about 37 microamps additional current due to the um, this periodic switch on. So we're looking at about sort of 60 microamps average current consumption. Now, um, when you've got a very complex current waveform, obviously you know you can make estimates, which are generally about right. But one thing that's really handy on a um, higher end scope is they've got an integral function. So if we turn on the integration function, this is now effectively integrating the the whole area under this curve. And um, we've got a very slight drift up here due to the static um, the static current consumption. As you can see, it's a lot steeper here where we're actually. Um, doing the on-time. So we've set the um, cursors to look at the math, math function. So if we just look at this difference here, it's telling us um, 67 microvolt seconds. So that corresponds to 67 microamp seconds, and because it's once every two seconds, that yeah, translates to about 33 microamps average current draw. And that, so that's now that is taking into account these these um, these spike as you can see the slopes increasing. One thing you've got to watch though is that if you've got any spikes that take it off the yeah, off screen, yeah, because the AC converter on the scope isn't actually doing any meaningful measurements here, then your measurements aren't really going to be that meaningful if any part of the sp the, the, the spike is actually off screen. And obviously, as you um, reduce the range, you're starting to disappear into the noise floor of the scope, so your your readings aren't going to be um, particularly meaningful. But say so that integration function, and particularly we've got a very complex on-off waveform, or for maybe it's coming on relatively frequently at random intervals. So we can also use it to look at the sort of cumulative effect over several of these uh, pulses. But again, we're starting to run into resolution issues on the scope, and it's probably not going to be super accurate. But so we've got this, you know, the gentle slope, which is the effect of the baseline current draw, and then the spikes for the um, instantaneous draw. So that can be a, a really handy tool for measuring, yeah, the long-term average battery consumption. Um, the other thing you can do, if you've got a really spiky waveform that's difficult to measure, you can just put a capacitor on the input of the device so that that will smooth it out. So, you know, you're still going to have the same amount of energy going into that capacitor plus the product, but the capacitor will just low pass filter it so it might be easy to catch um, rapid spikes. Now, these batteries have got a capacity, normal capacity around the sort of 16 to 18 amp hour sort of range, so they're sort of fairly, fairly chunky batteries designed for very long life application so at our 70 microamp normal current draw that gives a, a approximate 30 year lifetime obviously you want to add plenty of um, safety factors because obviously they, they won't perform well for example if these are run at low temperatures some of these are yeah monitoring stuff works underground so it needs to take into account low temperatures um, so sort of 30 years based on its current consumption but obviously there's the self discharge of the battery so they tend to be rated for about 10 years shelf life so um, this should be good for probably the somewhere in the 10 to 20 years sort of um, neighborhood so obviously, yeah that's why these are such a big battery it's just basically a fit once and forget it for the whole lifetime of the product so that's about it um probably the one you know the one thing that is a bit of a mystery is why they have this huge great sort of butt ugly thing hanging off the front i can only imagine that you know it was a, a requirement you know, I can only imagine that you know, these things are very subject to quite a lot of approvals processes. So this was probably the easiest way of adding that card functionality. So I'm sure you know there's plenty of space in here. They could have put like a nice card reader, maybe a sort of vertical entry card reader, and got it pretty much within the same profile as the unit. But um, I think one advantage of doing it as an add-on, it means that it probably doesn't affect any certainly any of the gas-related approvals of this thing, because it's just talking through this in thread pair. So there's clearly no issues with that side of things by um, adding this on. So uh, I'd imagine that more recent versions, yeah, they probably have integrated this stuff a bit more and maybe integrated the card reader. Because I mean, really the only difference this is doing is adding that card reading and accounting f a functionality, which I'm sure probably could actually be quite easily integrated onto this. So I'd imagine maybe later versions, they do have an, you know, an integrated card reader. They don't have this. Um, it's probably in a cupboard under the stairs, so you don't really notice it. Just not, not a huge elegant solution. So, and also just this, this valve, it just seems to be a a rather expensive way of doing it. I would have thought there would be uh, cheap ways of achieving the same, um, same functionality.